He was faithful, though Samuel was a faithful servant of God, preaching God's word faithfully. His sons end up not being so. So let's look at verses 1 through 3. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel, which we just said means that Yahweh is God, and the name of his second was Abijah, meaning God is my father. We're going to come back to how important that is. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. And they took bribes and perverted justice. Sounds very familiar. We see here a correlation between Eli and his sons and and Samuel and his sons. There's a little bit of a parallel between the two. Both were leaders of Israel and both of their sons. uh, All of their sons turned out um, wicked. So, So... There's something to learn here. First and foremost, though, I want to look at the contrast, because there is a contrast, I believe. You see the contrast in the names of their sons, even. I believe that that Eli was not intentional about being a father. We see it all throughout the lives of his children and how he finally reacts to their their blatant sin. But we see evidence that, that, that Samuel was a little more intentional. We see it even in the names. You have Hophni and Phinehas. That's the names of Eli's sons. Those are Egyptian names. Named after Egyptian uh, 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 characters. And so we see, even from the beginning, Eli was not godly in his intent to raise his kids. And yet Samuel named his children Joel, Yahweh is God, and Abijah, God is my father. So there was an intent, you see, at least in, in, in Samuel's life, to, to, to obey God and raise his kids uh, under the teachings of Yahweh. Now, here's the lesson for us. Just because you're faithful to God does not mean your kids will be. And so we have a lot of counseling sessions with parents who worry, why did my kids turn out when we had them in church and we taught them God's word and and did all these things and now they're living on their own? Again, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it is not a guarantee that your children will obey the word of God. It's a guarantee that no matter how wicked they get, that teaching will not depart from them. They can't run away from it. It's going to be there. So what do we do? And this is just a quick insert for parents again. This means we do our best and trust God for the rest. Now that sounds like a very simple little poem but it's real. That word best is serious. It means very intentional. Do your best means you are going to be intentional about raising your kids for the glory and honor of God. You're going to train them up in the word. You're going to put Christ before them. You're going to model that. Not only teach them what God's word says, but you're going to model that as parents because you're doing your best. You're being intentional. But once we've done that, if we are intentional, about raising our kids for the glory of God, there's the point where we trust God for the rest because he's sovereign, and we rest in that. So Samuel was faithful, faithful judge for many years. His sons were not, and therefore that brings up a problem. When his sons begin to be wicked, the people had already had enough of Eli and his sons in the past, and therefore they see this, and it causes the great change. This is one of the catalysts for them saying, hey, we want to change. So we see this in verse 4 and 5. Then all the elders of of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, your son, uh, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now let's stop here because we have to look at this. First of all, it wasn't wrong for them to ask for a king in, in itself. That alone is not the sin here. God had already made provision in the law in in Leviticus for the appointment of kings. God is the one who sets up kings and takes down kings. He's the one who instituted government and governments. So obviously that in itself is not the sin. However, it's the reason they want a king. That's the problem. It's the reasoning. So that we might be like other nations. And here's the key, here's, the, here's, here's why that's so rough, because God has always called the nation of Israel, his people, to be different than all the other nations. That's what it means in Leviticus 20, 26, when it says, you shall be to me, uh, you shall be holy to me, 
For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Leviticus 19.2 says, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And one way to understand that word holy is, yes, it means to be set apart unto God and his, like he says, you are mine. But we can also substitute the word different. It means to be different. God is saying to Israel, be different because I am different. I am holy, you be holy. Therefore, if you are holy like me, you will be different from the godless nations around you. So, so that's still a command, folks. I think the church, again, we have an aversion, it seems, in this day and age to the idea of holiness, to this idea of being different than the, the culture around us, right? I mean, when you think about it, as many Christians, they, uh, they think that programs are the answer, right? We, we must have programs and methods and beliefs and doctrines that are compatible with the programs, beliefs, and methods of the culture. And so we sometimes borrow even from our culture, the church, looking to the culture and getting its cues on how to best succeed. I mean, that's why so many theologians today and pastors are touting this new, false, hermeneutical revelation <laughs> that says, oh, for the past 2,000 years, we've got it wrong. We have been misinterpreting the Bible for the past 2,000 years. Now we've got it. But you see, for the past 2,000 years, the church has misinterpreted what the Bible says about sexuality, about gender, about marriage, about the creation order. All of that is misunderstood. We've got it right today. Now, there's, there's a problem. I hope you see the red flag that should be rising, right? If, 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 if God can't get his truth to his people over 2,000 years, I'm worried about that God. If he's not sovereign enough to give us a word and to preserve that word and to make that word known to his people, that's a problem. But that's what that kind of theology says, right? God was trying to communicate. He'd been trying to communicate with us, and we've been messing it up, and we finally got it right. Today, folks, listen to this. We believe without a question that God spoke a word to his people, 2 Timothy 3.16, confirmed that that word is truth, John 17.17, 17, instituted his church as the caretaker of that word on earth, 1 Timothy 3.15. Therefore, it is God's will that the culture be informed by his word rather than his word be informed by the culture. And, and so I am a little passionate right now about this because this is so, so fresh, it seems. Isn't it coincidental? Isn't it just ironic? Isn't it just something? How that now in our cultural moment where things are, all of a sudden now that's where the Bible is supposed to be. Oh, that's what the Bible meant all those years. It's exactly what the culture is saying today. Folks, again, the culture is to conform to the word of God, not the opposite. And that's why the church is the pillar and ground of truth. And our job, we are sadly, sadly uh, inept as a whole, the church in general, at being faithful caretakers and proclaiming the word of God as it is. And as Spurgeon told us, simply let it loose as it is. It will take care of itself. We don't have to try to make it palatable to people. We don't have to try to make it fit into culture. We don't have to try to cut off the sharp edges. We just simply preach it in love and trust God and his Holy Spirit to begin to do its work. So a holy people will always be at odds with a godless culture. That, I think we, that's our biggest problem. We all want to be liked, right? Remember high school? Are you honest? Be honest. We all want to be liked. We, we all want to be accepted. We all want to be loved, and those aren't bad things, but we find that ultimate love and that ultimate acceptance and that ultimate belonging and that ultimate fulfilling in our King, Jesus Christ, and among his people. And therefore, we need to accept this. We need to, we need to somehow come to grips with this truth that to be holy means I will be at odds with a godless society. 
Doesn't mean I don't love that society or, or live in that society or know people and have friends in that society. It just means I might as well understand I will be different if I am subject to my king and holy unto him. Now, let's continue. By, by, by wanting a king then, like the other nations, Israel really, here's the biggest part of this. Here's the sin of their heart. By wanting a king to rule over them like they see these other nations have, they are literally forsaking and rejecting God as their king. And God says that. Look at verse 6 through 9. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, which was the right response. Again, notice what Samuel does. He doesn't respond in his own leadership or in his own anger or in his own disgust. He prays. He takes it to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. Here it is. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. They're rejecting my authority in their lives. They're unwilling to humble themselves and submit to my leadership. They would rather walk in their own knowledge and wisdom and do it their way than submit to me and trust in me. So he says, according to all the deeds that they have done, and this is very, very vital that we understand what, we're, what God says here. This is such a, a tremendous verse in Scripture. Look at this. According to all, here's how they've rejected me. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So really, in these verses, we have this, this, um, this, this very direct uh, uh, statement and, and this thesis that God lays out concerning the history of the Israelites. I mean, he says, basically here, he gives us a 1,400-year, a nearly 1,500-year history of the nation of Israel. How have they been spiritually? They have done nothing but reject me. For 1,500 years, since the time I brought them out of the land of Egypt until now, the days of, the, of, of King Saul, which is about 1,500 years, they have done nothing but continually reject my leadership and stubbornly do their own thing. Wow. And this present request for a king is just one more evidence, God says, of their hearts to wander away, how prone their hearts are. It's an evidence of the, the proneness of our heart to wander away from God. And it's for all of us. If you go to Judges 12, 12, we, we see this, right? We see this glimpse into why they wanted a king. As, they, as the Samuel looks back and says, here's what you all did. Here's your problem. He says, and when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us. When the Lord your God was your... But that government is to replicate the direct law of God to the people. And God says that in Leviticus when he talks about a king and he says, you will be different and your king will be different. If you do have a king... He should be different. He will read my word. He will obey my laws. And he will promote those laws to the people. And just a quick note, we don't have time to get into this, but that's what Romans 13 is all about. Government is good, and government should be followed, and we should submit to government as long as government is submitting to God and they are walking in their God-ordained lane. That's a whole sermon. We're not going there. But we see that we see... The, 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 the hinting of all of that right back here in the Old Testament. The warning is literally a godless government, a corrupt government, which happens because it's filled with humans. And they will, there will always be corruption. We will never have utopia in this world with human-run government. Some governments, yes, will be better than others. And it's important who is in government, yes. 
But the bottom line is this. When we choose a human-run government over a God-ordained rule, and, and this was what they were. They were a theocracy. God was their master. He was their king. And they were to simply rest and trust and follow and obey him. Because he is good. He is just. He is perfect in all of his ways. He is not corrupt and he's not selfish in his intent to rule us. He loves his people with an everlasting love. And yet these people say, no, we don't want that God. We want our God, a God of our making, like the other nations, a human like us. Well, here's the problem. No matter what kind of government that is, in some sense, the people will be a slave to that government. And, it's, and, and this is true. We give up some of our freedom for earthly safety. We give up some of our, of our, of our protection, in a, not our protection, but our, our freedoms. And we are, in a sense, slave. We have to, how many of you, oh gosh, I don't mean to get off on this, but what a day it's been. Might as well keep on going, right? Do you really own your property is my question. Hey, my house is paid off. Is it? Do you pay property tax? And you will pay that till the day you die, or they'll take your house. Whose house is that? Okay, I'm not going all the way down that track. I'm simply saying that an earthly government, to some extent, the people are saying, yes, we will serve you, and you will be over us. To one extent or the other, we're all saying that, and that's what, what, what Samuel's telling them, naturally. But in this case, supernaturally, God is warning him because he knows Saul's heart. He knows his selfishness. He knows the corruption that will come. And God is saying, this is what's going to ultimately happen. It's going to, it's going to be just an abuse, in a sense, at, at the extravagance that this king demands and that a monarchy demands. And we see it all around the world. Monarchies. I mean, the, 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 the tradition and the royalty and the pomp and circumstance and the staffs. And that's what he's, what he's saying here. I like what the New American Commentary says to kind of explain all of this. It says, the decision to have a permanent king meant much more than the addition of one person to the circle of power in Israel. It entailed the establishment of a permanent, multi-tiered, bureaucratic institution utilizing the services of thousands of individuals. To underwrite this form of government, vast quantities of personnel and family resources would have to be given over to the king. So that's what Samuel was trying to warn about here and trying to tell them we, we had a God who loved us, a, a king who was faithful. He called for our total submission Yes, our undying allegiance and our obedience, yes. But he was a good king. And now he's going to give you what you're asking for. And this is what you're asking for. And what's their response? Verse 19, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no! No! But there shall be a king over us, and look at this, that we also may be like all the nations. We want to fit in. <laughs> we want to be like them. We want to be invited to all their summits. And blah, blah, blah. And he goes on to say, look at this, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. That is almost ludicrous for us to hear this. To denounce the ultimate sovereign power of the universe as your king in order to take up a man, a human being, as your protector, the one who will fight your battles, the one who will judge you. It's insane when we think about that. And yet that is what sin has done to human beings. It's insane to worship ourselves and our idols over and above Yahweh, the God of the universe. And so <laughs> Samuel, when he heard these words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. Again, I agree with him. In that, in that moment, 
there's nothing left to do but pray. I mean, Samuel's so broken, he can only cry out to God. Lord, this is what they're saying. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to all the men of Israel, meeting adjourned. Go home. You got your way. Now, as we, as we kind of begin to wind this down, I want to talk about some, some contrasts between chapter 7 and chapter 8. Isn't it amazing? It's, it's actually sad to look at the contrast between chapter 7 and chapter 8. In chapter 7, again, as we mentioned at the beginning of this message, there was a helplessness and a hopelessness, and it was recognized and admitted by the people. They repented, and they leaned totally on God. Totally crying out to him, Lord, only you can deliver us. Our hope and our trust is in you. There is not an ounce of hope or reliance in us. So we'll obey you. In this case, God blessed them in chapter 7 where he thundered and the enemy was destroyed. In other cases of the Old Testament, though, you say, well, what about the times where Israel fought? See, they relied on themselves. No, they were obeying God. He told them what to do. Their reliance was still 100% in him. And that's what we have to understand. Relying on God with all of our heart soul, mind, and strength doesn't mean we sit down in, in some clover field and wait for God to do everything. We are still going to be active because we're called to be obedient. But our trust is totally in Him. That's why we obey Him even when He commands us things that are contrary to the culture that we live in. And even though by obeying those commands, we may be looked at as crazy or old-fashioned or whatever. And yet our allegiance and our trust is 100%. Our reliance is on him. And that was chapter 7. Now in chapter 8, they refuse to rely on God. Out blatantly, just, just right out and blatant, Lord, we will not rely on you. Give us a human king. And let him deliver us. <laughs> but also we see a parallel between four, chapter 4 and chapter 8. I want to talk about that real quick. Because it's interesting that we put all this together. That's what the Bible's for. We see the big meta narrative, the big picture. So what we've got going on here is they're trusting in something other than God. That's what they're saying, right? We want to substitute for you, God. We want to trust in something other than you. And that's exactly what they did in chapter 4. Only it was superstition at that point. And then now in chapter 8, it's politics. But in both chapters, they are trusting in something other than God. And again, we do it. As well. And don't panic. I'm not going to go crazy on this subject. But superstitions, we have, a, have them. We live this way. We don't, we don't take God's word as our sole authority and say, this is what God says, so I trust it. We have weird superstitions sometimes that we add in to things. Even legalism can be a superstition, I think. If you miss church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night, you're, ooh, bad things will happen. Right? If I forget to read my Bible today, ooh, bad things will happen. In a sense, that becomes very superstitious as well as legalistic. And then the politics is very obvious. I mean, and I'm not going to say a lot about this, but it's so tempting and easy for us as human beings in this world to inadvertently, and sometimes maybe even being unaware of it, but put our faith and trust in humans and in government and certain political candidates rather than solely trusting and relying in the sovereign God of the universe. Now, again, I, we, we always love to go to extremes, so everybody will leave here and say, well, Greg doesn't think we should be involved in politics or vote, and, and that politics is bad. I never said that. We should be, again, obeying our Lord and being active in our world to make a, a kingdom influence. And yes, if we live in a democracy where we vote and we're in that God sovereignly placed us here, so that's our responsibility as citizens of this nation. 
And so, so yes, vote. But we do not put all of our trust in the one we're voting for. And we don't go crazy <laughs> when it looks like everything's falling apart in that sphere of influence. We humbly get on our knees and rely on the real king. And we trust him. So in conclusion, there's four takeaways I just want to, want to look at from this text that we looked at today. So one of those is we have a tendency to respond to problems mechanically rather than spiritually. That's, again, a human nature thing. We respond to problems mechanically or physically rather than spiritually. We believe the problem is with our programs rather than with our prayer life. We think the way to fix the problem is by recalibrating our plans rather than repenting of our sins. So I want to say that again. We think the way to fix the problems in our life is simply recalibrate our plan rather than repent of our sin. And Dale Ralph Davis puts it like this. It's easy for us to look for a new gimmick rather than cry out, for a new heart. It's easy for us to look for a new gimmick rather than to cry out for a new heart. And that's really all God's people have. We daily cry out for a new heart. A new heart that trusts God in the midst of pain. A, a new heart that has faith in him even when we can't see why he's doing what he's doing. A new heart that submits to him when our stubborn flesh says no a new heart that loves our enemies, a new heart that loves one another, a new heart that serves, that every day, every, to be a, a, a good husband, I have to cry out to God for a new heart every day. To be a, a, a good son or daughter, you have to cry out for God, for a new, to God for a new heart. To be a good employee, to be faithful in this world in any sphere of influence and in any way, we have to cry out to God to give us a new heart. And only out of that new heart, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God and informed by the Word of God, can we live an effective kingdom life for the glory of God. So number two, we learn that instead of trusting God to help us, we are much more interested in telling him how to help us. <laughs> and, and that's a bad thing. And yet that's what they do. Well, God help us, but here's how you're going to help us. You're going to give us a king, and we're going to be like other nations, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. Lord... You're going to help us, but here's how you're going to do it. You're going to give us this particular king in the next election. And that's how you're going to help us. Lord, you're going to give me this boss. You're going to give me this job. You see what I'm saying? Lord, I'm going to get accepted at this school. That's how you're going to help me. That's my plan. That's, oh, I'm sorry. That's your plan. <laughs> so we have this tendency in our flesh, we just have to admit all this. And this is what 1 Samuel's ripping away. It's ripping this away. God's word reveals humans, humans as they are. That's how we know the Bible's inspired. Men, if men wrote the Bible, they would not be showing their flaws like this. But God's word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, rips off the facade and shows us we are broken sinners, selfish, and we run from God rather than repent to him. So let's stop trying to tell God how to do things, and let's simply plead for his help and trust him that his ways are best. And obey him when we see the direction. God, number three, here's a lesson. God at times gives us what we ask for. And that's not good all the time. That's not always good. But God will give us what we ask for. So once again, let our asking be informed by the gospel. Let our asking in prayer be informed by the word of God and by his will, not our will, is what, what that lesson is for us. And then fourthly, this is so, so much needed in my life. But listen, we learn that our solution may be truly rational. So our solution to the problem we're facing right now, our, our plan, may be totally rational. Ralph Davis says this, our proposals and solutions can be completely reasonable, clearly logical, obviously plausible, and utterly godless. 
we got to grasp this. This is, this is strong. For believers who want to honor God, we got to understand this, that many times what we want to do is not overtly sinful or even rebellious in itself. And it may be perfectly plausible, reasonable, logical. And yet, if we are not utterly dependent upon God, first and foremost, it is utterly godless and strictly human and therefore becomes sin. So I guess, as we wind this up, the question for all of us is, who is the king of your life? Who is the king of, of your life? The good little Christians here, we all want to say Jesus, right? Jesus is king. However, by our actions, we... We say that we're, 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 we're just like the servant in the parable of the minas in Luke 19. Our actions, our lifestyle says, we may not say this blatantly out loud out of our mouths. And yet in this parable, Luke 19, 14, look what, the, look what when the master gave them a job to do when he left, he said, hey, continue to work until I come back. Verse 14 says, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And I'm telling you what, Christian, along with me, our hearts, human hearts are deceitful. And they many times are saying, I will not have this man rule over me. I will say I'm a Christian all day long. I will go to church. I will proclaim that I believe his word to be true. But by your life and your actions and your decisions, you are saying, I will not have this man to reign over me me. May we repent and cry out to God, give us hearts of submission. Give us hearts that long to please only you, that we may bring you glory. Let's pray. <sighs> Father, our prayer today is simple. And yet, only you can answer this prayer. And that is, may you give us hearts to trust you as our king and our only king. And whatever your spirit has to work in us, each individual here knows what kings have to be dethroned in their lives in order for you to rule. But Father, let us be humble, submissive, and broken enough to repent and confess and turn from that sin and trust you as our king and follow you and obey you that you may be glorified. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.